Uh, hello everyone, thank you for joining us. My name is Cameron and this is Matt. We're two current FY1 doctors. We're here to talk to you a bit about the life of, of an FY1 doctor and also a bit about the foundation program itself. We want to keep this really interactive, really informal, so please fire away as many questions as you can and we're going to try and answer as many as we can today. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, coming to the end of my FY1 year. I'm currently uh, doing cardiology at Wickham Hospital and uh, looking forward to a change of scenery which is a bit new and different in a week's time moving on to neurosurgery. So uh, happy to answer anything about what I've been doing and what I be, will be doing and if Matt wants to introduce himself briefly. Yeah hi guys my name's Matt. Um, I'm an F1 at Royal Hunter Hospital in Sheffield. Um, currently my job description is a bit odd. I'm kind of the uh, surgical F1 on a COVID minimised uh, elective ward. Um, but I've worked in neurology, uh, breast and plastic surgery, and was working in geriatrics for a bit, being redeployed there. Um, so yeah, I think as Cameron said, we're going to take it nice and informal, just kind of answer any questions that people have. Um, yeah. So first question, Tuck from Tyler, how do you think COVID-19 will change the NHS and how would you like it to change the NHS? <laughs> Good question to start with. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to start, Matt? Um, I'm not sure how it will change the NHS as a whole, but I can definitely uh, talk about how it's changed my work on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we all have to wear PPE now for a start. Um, <laughs> full gloves, gown, uh, and it, gloves, gown, and mask. Um, and things like even in the office, you've got to keep all the computers an hour meter apart and stuff like that. Um, and you're trying to, I mean, initially during the peak, we were trying to minimize patient contact time as much as possible. So, you know, if you could go in and do bloods, examination, history, uh, all at the same time by one person trying to do that. Um, yeah, and, and, and the job description, like I said earlier, um, I, I was redeployed to a non-COVID geriatrics ward, uh, and I've now been since redeployed again um, to what is a COVID-minimized elective surgical ward, um, where essentially all the patients admitted onto the ward are elective surgical patients, and they've had to self-isolate for two weeks prior to being admitting, being admitted, and have a negative swab, um, and I've gone from managing just breast and plastic patients to kind of being the junior for all these different specialties like gynae, head and neck, ENT. Um, and you, you've got to be a, a bit more flexible with um, things like, you know, changing, doing, do, doing things that you've not perhaps done before, um, but always making sure that you know who to contact in, in the kind of next step up in the escalation ladder in terms of your SHO or registrar in that specialty. Cool. Um, I mean, similar point to me, the practice has changed for me. I haven't been redeployed, so I was on cardiology uh, when COVID first hit, and I've stayed on there because of, of the pandemic. Um, I think a few things have changed in terms of our practice. So a lot of outpatient clinics have been now converted into telephone clinics. It's obviously to try and minimise patient contact, minim minimise flow through the hospital and reduce spread of the virus. Um, we, as F1s, haven't necessarily been involved in that as much because the telephone clinics tend to be run by the registrars and the consultants. So that hasn't really changed our practice, but it has certainly changed how the department is run. Um, I've also noticed one of the big changes is in terms of getting people out into community beds. So you'll find, uh, especially on things like geriatric wards, a lot of patients aren't necessarily have medical problems when they come in they have a lot of social issues in terms of they're not able to care for themselves as well as they used to be before and they need more care going home so before the pandemic used to find that a lot of beds used to be taken up by these patients who had nowhere to go because it's not safe to send them home um, so, but amazingly the uh, occupational health team the uh, physiotherapy team and the discharge planning team have stepped up their game massively and they've been able to get people out of the hospital super quick and set up these package of cares um, amazingly quickly for these patients uh, to stop them staying in hospital. So I think that is something that we've really improved upon during this pandemic and I'd love to see that continue because we don't want people staying in hospital any longer than they need to be. So um, 
I think that's uh, an amazing thing we've achieved so far. Cool. I'd agree on that. Uh, what else have we got? So, should we just scroll down and try and keep up with it? Yeah. Sure. Okay, so I think the next one down on the list is what's your work-life balance like as an F1? So, a standard week, we're voted to do about 40 hours a week, which um, obviously doesn't give you too much time, for spare time, but you are able to fit as much in as you can. Obviously, at the moment as well with the pandemic, it's difficult to socialise and try and use that free time when you have it as well as we used to before. I try and keep doing something every week. What I like to do... Oh, hello. Oh, don't mind me, I'm just here to moderate the session. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> no problem. Um, so... Weekends can be tiring. You've, you've got obviously a long working week and sometimes you just want to take a couple of days to chill and just relax. Uh, I like, I find that on a Friday night, if I'm able to do something on that Friday night, it could be anything. It could uh, be just going over to friend's house chilling or it could be going out for a drink. It could, anything that you can do, something on that Friday night makes you feel like when you wake up on that Saturday morning, you've already had a day of your weekend and it makes that weekend draw out a bit longer than it would have usually and it makes you feel yeah, like you've got a bit more time off than actually you have so i like to do that to try and uh yeah maximize my my time off um matt have you got anything to add yeah i, I agree on that i do the same as well um i think the the work-life balance varies depending on which specialty you're on um I know some people do like psychiatry, community psychiatry as an F1 and it's nine till five, Monday till Friday, and um, others are working very long hours. Um, I, I found personally for me, uh, it was difficult getting the work-life balance right at the start um, because it just becomes, it is tiring when you're starting work. It's tiring getting used to all the systems and procedures in place in the hospital that you work at, but that gets better with time and then your work-life balance improves. Uh, and one thing that I do is just just pamper yourself. If you're feeling, you know, you're going to have bad weeks, you're going to have good weeks. Make sure you've got something at home that you like, be that a kind of beer, TV program, something like that. Make sure you're doing something that that you enjoy to keep yourself going for those bad weeks, um, because they're going to happen. Um, you just got to get get yourself through it with whatever whatever makes you happy. Next question from Leah. What what specialties specialties did you guys enjoy, and why? Um, so obviously, with the with the pandemic, or uh, well, so 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 you do kind of in in F one you do three four month placements, um, and usually there's a mixture. You may have a community job. It's more likely that they'll be based in a hospital. Um, and often you'll have a medical and, and usually a surgical job, at least at some point in year F1 or F2 year. Um, with the pandemic, uh, the changeover from your second to your third placement was cancelled uh, nationally. Um, so quite a lot of people have only actually experienced two specialties. Uh, for me personally, I started off in neurology, uh, which I enjoyed. Um, it, was, it was a good job. It was quite specialised, so you're ordering a lot of tests and managing a lot of diseases that you didn't know a great deal about. Um, I then I then went on to breast and plastic surgery, which which was a good job just to get to get get an idea of kind of um, how surgical patients are managed both before their operation and after their operation. Um, but I think the job, especially that I enjoyed the most, um, was when I was redeployed to geriatrics. Uh, and I think geriatrics is a really good job to have in your foundation years because it's a gen it's a generalist. Um, specialty so you're dealing with top to toe medicine um in patients who have uh, multiple morbidities and are on multiple different types of medications um so it and usually it's pretty well supported in regards to like uh, senior house officers and registrars so you get to learn a lot as well so to so the, so the place in that i enjoy the most is i think geriatrics so i started my f1 year on acute general medicine so i was on an acute medical unit on a day-to-day -day basis to, uh, taking patients just off the medical take and then i would also be on the medical take uh for 
a shift or two shifts a week. I really enjoyed that. It's quite a fast paced job. It's very general. So I got uh, exposure to all different types of medicine and I got exposure to clerking patients and also um, then seeing them the day after and where they would then go in the hospital. Um, I then moved on to cardiology. So I've now been there for eight months in total. Cardiology is really interesting. I really enjoy it. So it's a, I really enjoy physiology and pharmac pharmacology and cardiology as a medical job is the perfect blend of those. You get to, uh, we get to see some really interesting patients and really uh, understand or try to understand at least what's going on with them and have to think about things and the medications you're going to use now you're going to treat them rather than just give them whatever some antibiotics and hope for the best um i think it's slightly more surgical in my department at least than normal medical jobs because it's the consultants tend to be fairly old school in the way they run things um they're definitely as you will find out when you start becoming a doctor yourself or if you are a doctor already you know that the way medical and surgical wards are run is slightly different um, and that suits different people different ways some people uh, prefer to be more involved and thinking much more holistically and some people like to be a bit more to the point with things um, and that's why there's so many different specialties in medicine and that's why as I'm sure you will have your favorites and you will find your niche very quickly and what you you enjoy yourself. Okay, uh, we've got, I'd like actually like to combine the next two questions into one. So we've got, what is the most challenging part of FY1? And also what is the transition like from medical student to doctor? So the reason I'd like to combine those two into one is because I think the most challenging part of FY1 was the transition. So in medical school, you uh, you learn a hell of a lot. And when you come out of medical school, trust me, you will know everything you need to know. You've done fantastically well. You've got your three finals. Your knowledge is up to scratch. You're not used to actually working in a hospital day to day. And the, the jobs that you're doing aren't usually testing your medical knowledge so much. It's learning how to communicate properly with teams, learning how to uh, problem solve um and learning this new environment although you've been in hospitals a lot over your previous few years it, it definitely feels different when you are a doctor and i think that transition of into a doctor of having that responsibility and having that slightly different role on the ward i found the most challenging thing people are going to come up to you the nurses are going to come, come up to you and say doctor here's a drug chart or here's an ecg blah 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 and they're looking to you for help and advice which is not something you'd have as a medical student as a medical student you could sit back and you might be able to understand what's going on but that decision was never on you and that transition into that role takes a little bit of time to get used to you will get used to it very quickly and i'm sure a lot of you will enjoy that um enjoy that responsibility but that that was, I think, the most challenging thing for me at first. What do you think, Matt? Yeah, that is definitely one of the most challenging. Um, uh, I think, yeah, thrive in that responsibility because it is a step up. Um, but you know, it's kind of your natural progression um, in your kind of career. And always bear in mind that there's there's seniors around. Don't don't be. Uh, outside your comfort zone if you're not sure on anything if the nurse does ask you for to review a patient or an ECG or something and you're not quite sure always go to someone even if it's an F1 colleague um, go to someone just to double check it if you're not quite sure the thing that I found most challenging at the start I would say was time management I think um, how how your day-to-day -day works uh, in a hospital is you'll do the ward round and all these jobs will be generated from the ward round um, and often there's a lot of jobs and not a lot of people to do those jobs uh, and you'll need to prioritize what he's doing um, first and what can wait until later um, which which comes comes with experience knowing that obviously um, anything that's kind of clinically urgent clinically pressing needs to put into the top of the list bloods usually come after the ward round because then you've got the afternoon to review them and uh, do any, do any treatments that need doing, say for example, if their electrolytes are a bit off. Um, 
and, and with time management, that yeah, that definitely comes comes with the job. Um, but it helps if you're working in a team to delegate jobs between you um, to, to find out, you know, um, how you're going to divvy them out and how how you're going to get them all cra- uh, sorted. Because um, you, you're always in part of the team, you're never going to be on your own. Um, next question: How is it like being on call? Um, this kind of kind of follows on nicely from what what we've just been talking about. Um, because because when you're on call, um, you're, you're you're covering the ward. Um, and you're the person, the first person people will go to if there's a problem uh, and if a patient needs to be seen. Um, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It is daunting the first time you do it. Um, it, it is, it's scary when someone's a bit unwell and you've got to go and assess them and try and work out what's going wrong and, and treat them. Always, uh, as, as Cameron was saying, you, you, your clinical knowledge is there. You know that because you'll have passed medical school to be in this position. So you can always fall back on those principles. And I think I think one thing that helped for me is knowing so long as so long as as an F1, so long as you, you do when in your assessment, you do an A to E assessment um, and you offer up some immediate kind of sensible management ideas and contact your senior, you're not going to go wrong. Um, the, I, I, always contact your senior. Or if you're unsure about anything, always always even just give them a phone call just for advice, just to run run it by them because um, they'd rather it be that way than you do something that you didn't really feel comfortable with and then finding out later. What do you think, Cameron? Yeah, um, as you say, it can be a little bit intimidating at first. Uh, certainly was for me. You know, you are part of a bare bones team during the evening or overnight uh, and it's your responsibility for the whole hospital which is which is scary but they're most obviously most patients are going to be sleeping comfortably and not going to be a problem um there will be you will get bleeped sometimes it, that's that's what i find quite interesting is the how it varies sometimes you'll have nights or on calls where you just never get bleeped at all and sometimes it seems relentless and you can't you're struggling to keep on top of uh of the bleeps as soon as you put the phone down you're having to call someone else you will get better at managing those you will get better at prioritizing those tasks matt was saying about that comes with experience which it which it will and you'll learn to spot which patients you need to see first and which patients can you can see later uh, there are a, there are common sense goes into a lot of it. You know, you, you want to see the person whose oxygen saturation is decreasing um, for no good reason over the person that just needs a cannula or some bloods taken. And and so a lot of it is common sense, and you you will naturally just pick it up. And then some of it will come with experience and practice. And again, as Matt was saying, if you have any doubts with any of those you can just call your senior there will be an f2 or an sho there for you and there will be a registrar i think we might have just lost cameron there a bit you with us Where's he gone? He's technically still there. He's frozen right now. Is he frozen for you too? Uh, frozen for me as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll carry on. Um, yeah, do you want to crack on with the next question? Yeah, yeah, that's good for that. Um, so, yeah, um, next question. What's the worst thing about being... How do I turn the camera on? Um, so, the worst thing about being an F1, it's a tricky question. Um, I think... What's the worst thing about being an F1? Um, re- responsibility can can be quite scary sometimes um, initially, um, but you do you do get used to that in time, uh, and you, you get to know what you're comfortable with and what you're not comfortable with. And there's always someone to contact. The work life balance is is a tough one, um, as Cameron was saying earlier. Uh, you, you'll average forty eight hours. Per week, that's the European Working Time Directive, 
but week to week that can vary a lot. So I've had weeks where you've had like 70 hours, 75 hours, and those weeks are grim. There's no, there's no denying that. Um, but you just, you just got to get through it. As I was saying earlier, make sure at the end of those 70 hour weeks, I always made sure I had a nice four pack of beers that I liked or something like that to kind of look forward to as a treat. Um, so I think the amount of hours that you, that you put in, uh, that's probably the worst part. Um, but you do learn a hell of a lot and, it, and it's, and it's worth it. You, I, you know, I, I've enjoyed my F1 year, um, in general, I'd say. Uh, Cameron, we were just talking, I was just talking about the worst thing about, I was just talking about the worst thing about being an F1, which I think for myself was, um, the hours, they're, they're long hours. Um, but yeah, what do you think? Did you mention the number of discharge, discharge summaries you've had to write? There's a lot of discharge. <laughs> There's a lot of discharge. Yeah. Summaries. And as an F1, you obviously you're the lowest ranking in the team and you end up having to do the, a lot of these admin jobs. Um, so it's part of the job it's what you have to do and it's is what the patient needs a discharge for me to go home so someone's got to write it uh but obviously some days when you're discharging quite a lot of people at once it can get tiresome <laughs> yeah. but but yeah it, it's a skill you'll learn you'll learn to write smash them out quickly um at the end of the day yeah. it's not it's not not too bad where are we up to you so uh mohammed asked where did you guys go to medical school? Any tips for students going into clinical placement years and what are your thoughts on integration? Um, so, so I went to King's Med School in London. Um, tips for going into clinical placement years. Um, I think, I don't know, it feels a while back now. Uh, I would say, know what you want to learn before you go in for the day. Like, don't just go in um, and kind of, loiter and not really do anything because that's just a waste of a day make sure there's things like have have something even if it's like a really simple thing like um i don't know how to how to read an lft blood test and know what that kind of means go in with that as kind of like a name for the day and then pester whichever whichever doctor you're shadowing um and try and find that out so that so that at least that way you, you your, your clinical placements are a bit more meaningful and kind of directed learning. Um, thoughts on interclation. I interclated uh, in neurology between my third and fourth year and I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a really nice break from medical studies. Uh, it's worth points on your application for foundation and also for specialty training, um, which is which is something. Um, but even if it wasn't worth points, I would probably recommend doing it because it's quite a nice, um, less intense year um, than your clinical placement years. So I split my degree. So I did my first three years, my preclinical years in Cambridge, and then at the, you can't, you're not able to do it anymore. But at the time, you were able to transfer to either Oxford or London after your third year to do your clinical studies and I moved down to London to Imperial College London to do yeah my clinical studies there so the Cambridge course you you have to intercalate it's um there wasn't a choice in the matter but I, I was more than happy with that that's one of the reasons why I applied and I did pharmacology and entrepreneurship I would recommend integrating for similar reasons that man said just it's fun to have a year out do something slightly different you're not you, although you seem to do quite a, a clinical medical based intercalation mine was much more um uh so i was mixed in with vets and and natural scientists so i was wasn't really looking at it from a clinical perspective it was much more a generic pharmacology degree and i really enjoyed that getting away from the standard medicine um either there so yeah i'd recommend it points for your FPAS, it's points for your specialty training. So it's really beneficial down the line. Although that, that is an extra year out. So it is a balance if you if you're wanting to try and get into medicine as soon as possible. But generally I think it's a really good thing to do. Just then a, oh, sorry, go on. I was just gonna ask I was gonna say in terms of <laughs> lag. In terms of my clinical placement tips, um Matt was saying about have a have a plan going in every day. Um 
there's almost always something you can do on the board. It's very, very frustrating sometimes you'll find that some teams tend to just ignore the medical student and just sort of hang around and do nothing. Um, there's there'll always be someone on the ward that you can examine or a history you can take or some bloods that you can do and to sh so showing yourself to be keen and showing yourself that you want to get stuck in with those sort of things can go a long way um the f1s might be quite busy and might not be able to spend some time teaching you but they might have a little job that you could go do for them like taking some bloods and they'll be very grateful for that and then they might find some time for you later on to uh allow you to take a history and then present back to them so yeah show you're keen and ask them if there's anything you can do um yeah like taking a history examine a patient if anyone's got any good clinical signs that'll be worth seeing the only other thing that i wanted to just add about intercalation so this is something to consider um when you intercalate you can either do a bachelor's or a master's and they're worth a different number of points um so you can intercalate in a master's after your third year um which is a 12-month course not a nine-month course so you don't get your three months summer holiday, um, but it is worth more points later down the line. So it, it's just something to think about, really. Uh, so the next two questions, again, seem quite similar. Yeah. So do you feel that you are looked down upon by your seniors and are they welcoming? So again, that will change from person to person. Uh, I've found being quite lucky in that. Uh, the, my team are fantastic that I work with now. My SHOs certainly don't look down upon me. The consultants sometimes it can feel a little bit that way. Um, but I think that's just a, <laughs> it, it changes from person to person. And some are really, really lovely, and some just want to get on with their job and aren't really interested in you pestering them too much. Um, I've never had anything bad happen though sometimes you know they can get have people a bit stern with you but i've never had any bullying or witnessed any bullying um myself so i wouldn't worry about seniors being rude or anything going into your job there'll definitely be some friendly faces around even if the consultants aren't interested yeah um Gen yeah, generally everyone's really nice, particularly your F1s and F2 colleagues, because there's a lot of camaraderie there, I think. Everyone's in the same boat. Um, in all walks of life, you're going to find people that aren't particularly nice. Um, there's a few old school consultants in my hospital, which are often in surgical specialties that you've got to be, you got to tread carefully sometimes. But I, I, I often find, to be honest, if if you are a bit worried about that, there's a lot of uh, a, a lot of like the ward sisters and ward clerks are really nice to chat to as well. Um, and they, they'll also, if you get if you if you befriend them and become pals with them, they'll give you a heads up on who to watch out for as well. Uh, but yeah, gen generally everyone's everyone's pretty nice to be honest. I mean, that's probably one of the best tips we can give you is befriend your sisters and your ward clerks. Yeah, um, they know how the ward runs they it's, it's their ward at the end of the day this is sister's ward they'll know what's going on all the time and if you need help with anything they're sometimes the best people to go to so make sure you stay friendly with them keep them on your side and that will be the most beneficial relationship you can probably yeah, make in the yeah, hospital yeah. I, this is jumping a few questions but um gem asked any tips to integrate yourself with your team which is a bit relevant to um, what we're talking about now um so yeah, important people to get to know your team are Ward Clark and Ward Sister. Top, they're, they're the top people, I'd say. First name terms, always always chat to them with the first name and just be friendly. I mean, it's it's, it's not rocket science. Um, ask how they are, how their day is. Um, yeah, Make them a cup of tea. Cup of tea is always a good one as well, yeah. Yeah, they always love a cup of tea. Right, where are we up to now then? Let's get to it a little bit. Uh, how does applying to deaneries actually work? What did you consider when applying? So um, you apply to your deaneries through the FPAS system. You apply through FPAS. FPAS will give you a score out of 100. 50 points of that is made up of the SJT, 50 points of that is your educational performance measure, which is made up of your rank within your year group and also extra degrees or publications. We won't go into that in any more detail now, but basically that score of 100 um, is your score. Everyone has a score. 
everyone in the country will rank all the deaneries uh, in preference order. So uh, I'm in the Oxford deanery, I put, I put that as my top, and then I can't remember exactly what I put underneath, probably like Bristol or South Thames, maybe Wales. Um, you, you rank the, all the deaneries in the, in the country, and then everyone also ranks all their deaneries in the country, and each deanery will then look at their uh, all the people that put it as their first choice and, and basically say, well, this person had the highest score they're in, this person had the next high score they're in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And basically the, the highest scoring people who apply to that genuine will um, will get in. Um, and then if, if you're unfortunate enough not to get into your top deanery, um, hopefully your score is high enough that you'll be able to get into your second choice, et cetera. Um, most people tend to get into their first one, two or three, as far as I'm aware. Very few people tend to get pushed out further uh, than that. Uh, I don't know if, Matt, you have any... I thought that was quite a good summary, yeah. Nothing to add. And then once you once you get allocated a deanery, your score again becomes in, it, that's not the end of it. The same score is used to rank your against all the other people in that deanery, and it's that rank which will determine your allocation of jobs. So you have all the jobs don't come as individual jobs; they come in groups of six jobs. So you may have. So in my case, I had acute general medicine, cardiology, trauma orthopedics, then neurosurgery, GP, ENT, and that came as a group of six. Um, and then you'll have another group of six, another group of six, another group of six, and you can't pick and choose jobs within those sixes. They come as sixes, and you rank those sixes in order of preference. And then similar to the deaneries, the deanery then says, well, the person with the highest score, they get their first choice. Uh, the person with the second highest score, they'll get their first choice unless it's already been taken by someone above them and they'll get their next highest choice. And it goes down and down and down and then everyone gets their jobs. Yeah. And with, with um, the reason why they're all in groups with sixes um, is because I think they need, so you're, you're on a training program, it's an educational uh, program, so there needs to be breadth of specialties for your learning so there has to be at least i think there has to be at least one medical placement and one surgical placement and usually one um community placement as well uh, and when 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 you get your deanery um they'll give you like an excel spreadsheet with all the jobs so you can kind of search within the spreadsheet so what i did was i kind of picked a few of the specialties that i'm interested in um, and bump those up to the top and you'll know wh which location they're in as well so you've got to do a bit of a way off between uh, whether you'd rather have the specialty that you really want or the location that you really want um, it's a bit of a, a long process to be honest because I think I had to rank about 150 jobs in my deanery um, but yeah I mean there's usually only like 40 or 50 that actually take your fancy and the rest can pretty much be random um, so yeah that's the only thing I'd add to that in terms of what you would consider when deciding, that's obviously a very personal thing. You may want to pick a deanery that's close to where you went to medical school. You may want to pick a deanery that's close to where you went to, where's, where's home, where school was. Um, you may pick it based on where friends are going. You may pick it where a partner lives. Um, it may be that there's a certain specialty you really want to do and there's a certain hospital that's amazing that does research in that particular thing and that's where you want to go. So obviously it's very personal um some deaneries are more competitive than others so depending on what your score is may slightly affect where you want to apply based on the likelihood of getting in i would advise against trying to be too tactical with it um but in general with a, a certain score you're going to have uh in theory a higher choice of job in a less competitive deanery than yeah etc et if that makes sense you can see on the cool. uk fbo handbook as well the kind of competition ratios um and it varies it varies year to year so yeah don't be too tactical about it once you know your score there's like a handy um calculator as well if you, if you just search up um you uh, your like f pass calculator will come up where it tells you like your likelihood of getting into x deanery um, and i use that it's quite helpful as well Thank <laughs> you.
So as your teacher foundation your posts. Okay, so yeah, that one that's very similar, aren't they? We sort of answered that already. Which which question? Mohammed's. We sort of answered Mohammed's. Yeah, yeah. How did you guys choose your foundation your posts as part of hiding? Okay, do you have any tips? We sort of answered that already. Any any thoughts or views of medicine changed, good or bad? It's an interesting one. Uh, can I drop you in that <laughs> straight away? Um, thoughts or views of medicine changed, good or bad? Um, I think I think what what my, my views have changed in the sense that after you finish medical, when you're a medical student and after, immediately after you've finished, all your knowledge is theoretical. You don't really know what, you, you've got really limited and we still have really limited experience of medicine in, in the real world as it's done. Um, so you get an idea of the things that are actually um, important as, as you do the job. And there's, and there's so many logistical and administrative things that you become aware of um, that you've kind of got to get loopholes to get through but again you, you get you get used to that um, with the job so I think my views on medicine have they changed during F1 I would say yeah um, in the sense that you realize that there's a kind of like a lot of non-clinical stuff that you've got to be aware of as well and do but that kind of stuff you, get, you, you do get used to um, and there's a lot of support for you as well. No. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure I can add too much to that. I think, yeah, in some ways, um, same as what Matt said, you realise there's a lot more medicine than just the textbooks in terms of the soft skills, the organisational skills, time management skills, yeah. and you develop those a lot very quickly. Um, but then on the broader side of things, I don't think it's changed too much. I still I'm still quite unsure about what I want to do as a career going forward. That hasn't changed, unfortunately. I was hoping something would uh, tickle my fancy and and uh, I'd want to do that. Um, so yeah, things have definitely things have definitely changed, and your your opinions and attitudes to how everything works will evolve throughout the throughout your career. And that's a good thing. Um, you learn from your experiences. I can't think of anything specific that's that's changed unfortunately um now sorry about that i can't i can't go into any more detail okay do you want to take the next one shall i uh yeah we can both have a crack at it how long have we left 10 minutes um so carol caroline has asked we, we've kind of answered this a little bit already um how did covid19 affect fy1 rotations so Briefly, as I said earlier, uh, you do these three four month placements, and um, everyone, all, all the rotations onto the third placement got cancelled, so everyone stayed on the second placement. And uh, some people, like myself, got redeployed uh, to where services were needed. Um, I imagine schedule surgical activity got postponed. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I. I got redeployed to a medical job and I've since been redeployed back to now this elective surgical ward and it, it's pretty busy because everyone's trying to catch up with all the delayed operations that weren't happening during the peak. Um, our trust, I, I don't think there's been any issues with delaying FY1 completion um, as far as I'm aware. Um, there was there was new guidelines set out um, which basically said that you you have to do a certain number of what's called supervised learning events, which are essentially case-based discussions um, or mini kexes, which is where a senior doctor watches you assess a patient uh, and they reduce the number that you needed to do um, for this year. Uh, and likewise, there's a number of core procedures that you have to do, which they reduce that number as well. So they made it a bit more easier for people to get by because they knew that um, teaching or training opportunities would be more limited during the pandemic, which, which has been the case, I think. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Cameron. I think you've answered that really well, as you said. Um, so in my, I was meant to be moving on to a surgical specialty, but as you suggested, it was, uh, oh, well, all medical students, all F1s didn't rotate. In fact, all junior doctors didn't rotate. Um, because, and also because trauma and orthopedics that I was going to rotate onto is essentially shut down because all the elective work had been cancelled. Um, 
so I studied in cardiology and yeah you obviously talked about you, so as a as an f1 and every year then progressing forward as matt was saying you have a portfolio which you develop full of these learning uh, points where you have mini cases they're called or case-based discussions and you you every year you have to complete a portfolio and every year you have what they call an annual review of clinical progression where um some senior doctors will look through your portfolio and see have you have you met the standards that have been set out for the, for the curriculum for that year and this year they reduced that um down a lot because of what covid had done and it limited everyone's ability to to complete um what needs to be done um i think it's too early to know whether next year's arcp requirements will be back to their normal or back or something similar to what they have been this year but that will be very clearly communicated to you if you're starting this year can I um, on the on the arcp um with so if i mean yeah we don't know how they're going to be changed but um one thing that i regret not doing is getting my core procedures done nice and early um make sure you're on it with those um so usually with the supervised learning events you have to do six per placement um two of which i think have to be with your supervisor uh, and 15 core procedures and i was probably a bit uh, lax at the start because i kind of allowed myself to get to, to get into the job but i was doing all the core procedures i just wasn't asking a senior to sign them off so any anything that you do it can be really simple make sure you, you just just ask a nurse senior nurse or one of your seniors if they could if you email them and get it signed off and then it'll be fine cool what about next what support is there for f1 so there's support from loads and loads of different places there's support from your team yourself around you the friends that you make on the job the support from the trust that you'll be in they'll have mental uh, health and well-being services there's external support from uh, organizations like the bma uh, from my point of view i actually find i get most of my support from my housemates and my close friends and that's mainly in the form of moaning to them when I get home from a long day or a frustrating day. Uh, and they also have a moan about their day and we all have a moan together. And we uh, um, then yeah, we chill, watch some university challenge and and relax. And I, I feel that I would have found things a lot more difficult without that support. Um, and it's what relates what, back to what was Matt was saying before about how around the f1s and the f2s around you you all sort of club together and uh, you have some camaraderie around it because you're all in it together and i i feel personally that that has been my um my biggest support group is my housemates my friends other f1s yeah definitely and that also helps with your work-life balance if you can chat with your friends because then you're not uh, holding stuff in and taking your baggage home from work um in terms of like official support with regards to supervisors uh, for each placement you'll be given a clinical supervisor um, who will be a consultant on the ward that you're working on and any kind of clinical issues day to day there the person who you can escalate to obviously going to your usually going to your senior house officer and registrar before them uh, and with any kind of non-clinical issues you'll be given an educational supervisor for the entire year uh, and they'll, you'll meet them every placement just to see how you're progressing with your educational uh, needs. And if you have any other needs that are not clinical, be them health related, work related, they're, they're the person to go to uh, for those kind of things. I'm just going to step in for a second. I think we've only got time for about one more question. And I don't know where you're, about you're up to, but one more. And then I think it's a day and people need to head over to the waiting room or the disco actually uh, for a bit of network okay, thanks james um sure. which one do you pick um i think the, the next one on the list to be honest what did you most with that one doctor because that's kind of what this talks <laughs> but yeah about, meant uh, to be about <laughs> You want to take that? Uh, sure. So, uh, usually a standard day, you'll you'll get in, you'll start prepping some patients for a ward round. So you'll go through the notes, you'll look at 
what's happened uh do you look at yesterday's wardrobe entry try and find out a bit about the patient what's going on with them um what jobs have been needed to do for them have the jobs from yesterday being completed you went to quickly have a look at their bloods make sure nothing's um scary is happening and you'll want to have a look at their observations so their blood pressure their heart rates their temperature um and make sure they're stable and you'll write basically a quick summary of all that's happened down with about those patients and then as, as many patients you can get through before the consultant turns up and then you'll do a ward round with usually consultant led sometimes they might be registrar led and on certain placements on certain more relaxed long stay wards it might even be you leading a ward round and you'll go around seeing each patient right basically writing down what the consultant says and does with the patient scribble those down the consultant will give you a plan in terms of jobs to do for that day so they might be chase bloods get an x-ray or get ct scan um speak to the urology team because blah blah blah, blah. i'll speak to the cardiology team blah 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 um and then you'll have to call them later and then or this person needs to go home write a discharge summary and then you'll spend once the water runs over you'll spend most of your pretty much the rest of your day doing all those jobs so calling other teams for advice and documenting that uh writing discharge summaries doing and chasing blood um that is generally what many you will be doing as an f1 i don't know if you've got anything else common thing that we do that's pretty much it isn't it um yeah um it doesn't sound very exciting when <laughs> you say that. yeah <laughs> not like that um yeah no that, that, that that's all you're doing and what you've got to remember is that um, big management decisions, you're, you're not making them. The, the senior doctors are making them. You're enacting some of them, but those big management decisions are being made by senior doctors. Um, and always know that there's support available. If your jobs list is really, really big, which sometimes it can be after a long ward round, try and get support available, be that. And, and it doesn't have to be medical. There's phlebotomy available to help take bloods. Um, you know, you, you, you can ask your F1 colleagues within your team and SHOs. Um, so, you see, so, so, yeah, always, always be aware that there's always support available for you. Um, and I guess the other, the other thing that I wanted to emphasize uh, as, as we're near the end is just, just, just relax and try and enjoy it. I mean, I remember this time last year, just before I was starting, I was bricking it and everyone's going to be anxious. It's, it's normal to be anxious about starting this job. It, it is a bit of a step up. Um, but if you, if you make sure you relax, make sure you know that there's support available you'll you'll enjoy the year and you'll learn a lot yeah echo the, that sentiment it's scary of course it's scary everyone's scared i'd be worried to be honest if you weren't a little bit scared going into it um but you'll do great your training will get you through never be afraid to ask for help it's you'll never you should never be in a situation where you you're scared to ask a, a question if you're not comfortable with something make someone else aware ask the question that's the right thing to do. You'll be absolutely fine. You'll have a great time. Although we might have painted a slightly sc scary picture at times, I have wholeheartedly have enjoyed my year. I've learned so much. Um, it's way better than being a medical student, although medical student has its picks. So good luck. And I'm sure you'll have a fantastic time too.